first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Um, you're in the, the cool room, as you can see from the, the events that we're going to have later. Um, as they say in the airlines, I know that you had an option of uh, talks and you chose to come to this one, so I hope that uh, I uh, make that worth your while. So <coughs> in presenting myself, one of the things that's important for me to say is more what I'm not than what I am. I am not a thought leader. I am not a rock star. Uh, rock star. Uh, what I am is just this guy who's been doing this thing for a long time. And I've seen a lot of stuff. I've experienced a lot of stuff. Uh, failures, successes. And basically what I'm bringing to you today is the results of observations in this... Uh, in doing this job of helping teams become more secure along the way of their uh, devel development efforts. Um, okay, so <coughs> to start the thing off, it basically doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're doing an agile, if you're doing a waterfalling, there's only so many ways that you can slice and dice to get a product out of the door. And these are the basic stations. You have to start with an idea, come up with a design, have the implementation, test the thing if you care about it, and eventually deploy and use. So this thing that we call the development process, as you all well know, can fail in a, in a, in a number of ways. And what interests us here is the ways that it can fail in terms of security. So if we do a very, very brief napkin exercise of threat modeling this single process, we're going to get to some interesting places. And just a, a shameless plug here, uh, after this talk, there will be Jonathan with uh, threat modeling. And after lunch, we're going to have the threat modeling panel. I would like to invite you all to go uh, come to both. There's going to be interesting stuff on uh, both of them. So if, as I said, we, we look at the things that fail when we are trying to develop something, the first thing between the idea and the design would be incomplete requirements. If you don't know what you're asking for, if you don't know what, um, what you expect to get out of that implementation, you probably are not going to get it at the end. When going from the design to the implementation, you could end up, end up with a non-secure design, and then everything is, is open. From the implementation to the testing, we could have developers who just don't have the security mindset. And from testing to uh, deployment, if we don't do enough security testing, then you don't have enough security findings. And the deployment itself, you can end up with, the, uh, with a leaky deployment, things that are just going places that they were not expected to, to go. So with that said, once we have those very simple threats, we nowadays know that we have some very simple possible mitigations for them. For the uh, incomplete requirements, we can try and plug that with compliance and risk requirements. And as Eric said in his uh, keynote, we already have people on the top, on the board and on management saying, hey, security is important. So we sort of got that one plugged. For non-secure design, we have threat modeling. I'm not going to uh, expand too much on that one because a better job will be done soon. For developers that, that, uh, that lack that uh, mindset, we have put in place training. We have this, this wonderful training modules that we, we give to people. For the insufficient or incorrect security testing, we have those many, many, many tools that all the vendors here are offering, and we have people who, ex uh, who specialize in security testing. And for leaky deployments, we have our security controls, our configuration guides, all that good stuff that uh <coughs> we make sure that people uh, use and that our customers sometimes make, make sure that we use and uh, we make them available for everybody. So the big question here is if we know the threats and if we know the possible mitigations for them and we spend many times, many hours uh, going through these mitigations, then why is it that this keeps happening? This is basically a graph from CV accounts, from cvdetails.com going from uh, 1999 to 2017 in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine um, major flaws. And we can't say that it's, uh, it's going up all the time, but it is going up. 
they, they, they are going up. And these are CV counts. They are not findings. So this is not our tools be getting better. This is not our processes getting better. This is the stuff that actually went out of the door and was found in the field. So if these, co com if these keep coming up all the time, it probably means that we are not doing such a good job as we think that we are. And why is that? Because basically we keep fighting the same single war. Threat modeling, still not widely adopted. We, we don't have something going all around that everybody says, yeah, I threat model, yeah, I know how to threat model, and yeah, I, I do it at the right time. So if it happens, sometimes it's just not optimal. The developers, even though we train them, they are not trained for security, but we still expect them to provide security. Okay? And <laughs> that's funny because unlike performance, if somebody comes in for a, a, an interview, how many times, show of hands, how many times you guys as security practitioners were invited in to, to interview a candidate for a developer just to check how much security knowledge they have? Anybody? Never. Anybody? No? Not? Really? No? On the other hand, coming in for a security uh, uh, interview, I actually was asked how would I implement a quick uh, Huffman code writer. So, <laughs> you see, that th there is this thing that performance is something that we are looking for in the people that come work for us, but security not so much. <coughs> we have the training material, but we have little absorption. I'm going to really, really rant about this one in a bit. But basically, we are putting the training out there. But the people who are taking it either are not really taking it, or we are not doing it right. The testing tools that we have, uh, even though some are really, really good, and they get good with every new version, like all my respect to those guys, but they are not yet where they should be. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of false positives, coverage is, is spotty here and there, and no ease of use. It's not something that you can give to a product team and say, hey, here, start using this thing tomorrow, and they'll be fine. The, the ramp up, sometimes it's unbelievably uh, difficult. And at the end, we have the security controls not being sufficient because of a number of factors that I'm, I'm not going into. Everybody here knows. Sometimes we are running behind on the security controls that we, we ask people to use. So just to level everybody up, uh, I would like to tell you a, a very short, very little story. These are Bob and Alice. They are not the Bob and Alice that you know. These are much cooler. Okay? Bob is a developer. He has a degree from somewhere in university. He writes mostly Java. And Alice is his manager. She's a technical manager. She's a development manager. She's not a security person. So one bright Thursday morning, Bob comes to work, and he has his Kaizen board. He's looking at his stuff. He always has a lot of stuff up there, a lot of stuff that, thing that he is doing at the same time. But usually he has this one story that he's working on, and then he has the, the other things. He has a bit of training here, a bit of training there, some documentation that has to review, something like that. You're a typical programmer, you're a typical developer. In comes Alice, while Bob is working on his, his task, the, the story that he chose for the day. And she says, hey Bob, a uh, customer just came to us, and he reported that we have something called an SQL injection. So I need you to get that report and take a look at it. S if, uh, if you see that these are not false positives, then I need you to address each one of the findings. And as you do that, I need you to completely understand this thing called SQLI, uh, SQLI in the environment that we work. I need you to find a solution. I need you to take that solution to the security expert that we have somewhere here. And if you don't have a solution, I need you to get a solution from him. And since this thing just appeared, I, I really need you to retake the SQL injection training module because I think that it's about time that you know what to do about it. So that was on a, on a Thursday. On Friday, oh, sorry, she also said, hey, can you find something global that's going to fix this whole thing from now on? I heard about something called ORM in a conference. I'm not quite sure what it is, but if you could check it, it would be great. So on Friday, it was the same thing, but with a buffer overflow. Even though um, Bob is a Java developer, there was some legacy code, and apparently he's the only one that can count curly brackets. So he was get asked to go and, and help. 
So that was Friday. Uh, it was uh, a pre-authentication uh, RCE. So he had to, s to spend basically the whole weekend in there figuring out what's what. And on Friday morning, Bob gave notice, left to Oregon, where he now has a business doing uh, tie-dye t-shirts. <laughs> the only thing that he wants to know about technology is getting Bitcoin to be paid. So the question here is, how many of you know or have been Bob? Most of us can identify someone that we know, somebody that's been there, that's crying to us saying, hey, I can't do with the context switches anymore. I, I, I can't deal with this thing called development and this thing called security on top of it. I'm being hit by all, from all sides and I don't know what to do anymore. The thing is that some of those problems we, we really can't help Bob with. But some of the security ones, at least, we not only can, but we have to. Um, and this is basically <laughs> the, in double quotes, change of culture that I would like to talk about, taking a trip on uh, Eric's keynote. Um, disclaimer, for all the time that I was in, uh, most of the time that I was in at, e at EMC, <laughs> Eric was my boss, and we have discussed this, this stuff lots of times, so I'm feeding a lot from what, what I got from the, the keynote. So, Seymour Cray once said that the problem with programmers is that you can never tell what a program is doing until it's too late. Once the story is there on the board, they pick it up, they start doing their, their thing, they'll do it. They'll do whatever's in their head. They'll implement the design, they'll figure their, their, only, their, their own solutions, they'll find the, last, the latest shining module that they're going to import, Lord knows from where, and they'll start using it. And we as security uh, people usually only get to know about all this stuff when the CV is out there. So that's why I have my own uh, addendum to Cray's thing that says that mostly neither can they when the issue is security. So at that time, that's when we realize that they don't really know what, uh, what they're doing. In that case, two things can happen. Everything can go on just as it is. And um, these guys basically will continue doing their own thing, and we will continue f dealing with the the uh, the fallback. Or they are going to use the security team as a resource, and that's when the security team itself becomes the bottleneck. So that same burnout that we were seeing at Bob, now you are going to see with the security pr practitioner. Bad news for the business, it's much more difficult to find a security practitioner than finding Bob. So if we walk out of the door because of the burnout, it's going to be a, a, a cost-benefit thing. So what are our obje objectives as security people? First of all, I believe that we want to know when things are happening so that we can deal with them in a way that stops being reactive. We don't want to deal with the stuff when it's a CV anymore. We don't want to do the threat model after the thing is almost out, out of the door. Because, seriously, we are not going to stop the product going out just because we found something that could be better on, uh, on the design. And we want to know this thing called notable security events. More about that in a second. We basically want to help Bob not write and deploy the next vulnerability. You all probably saw that nice graph that's uh, uh, an exponential curve saying that it gets much more costly to fix things as they go close to deployment or after deployment. We want to bring that as close to the, the beginning as possible. Uh, as you can see, I am trying really hard not to say shift left. But <laughs> and we want to remove the security team as a bottleneck, both for the developer and for ourselves. Um, the important thing is that we want to deal with the security problems of a higher order. We, can, we, we want to stop dealing with the day-to-day -day things so that uh, we can start thinking of better and, and more important things than fixing that little buffer overflow or showing that little uh, SQL injection. So what's, <laughs> what's almost... Uh, um, clear here that we need, we, we need to focus the security development on the developer, not on the security expert. Up to now, my observation is that when it comes to security development, 
Again, we let them do whatever they want, and then we come and bolt the security in. As much as we talk about baking it, baking it in from the beginning, it's always the security expert coming and saying, hey, you should do this, hey, you should do that, hey, this tool, hey, that tool, the report and the vulnerability. So the not notable security events, and, and here's where I start talking about the things that I, I really want to do in a different way. Bob there in the middle, he's the guy that is getting uh, a design, okay, and he is making his changes. So for example, he gets a design for, I don't know, something that asks for a specific data flow. While he implements it, he figures out that he also needs a different uh, channel, a different data flow that just does a ping, uh, a heartbeat. That's already a change to the design to permit implementation that has security uh, implications. So that would be the, the case of him saying, okay, I have a security event here, perhaps I should kick it back to the guy that deals with the threat model and say, hey, I got something here that might interest you. You may want to look at it or you may want to update the threat model that you have so that we know that whatever is being developed, the threat model actually do does reflect it. We don't have to go to the end of the, the chain and say, as the product goes out of the door, tell me everything that you have to tell me about what I missed since the last time that we threat modeled it. Same thing with the, the code. He is the guy that's writing the code. Actually, he's the guy that's writing the bugs. He's the guy that's implementing the flaws. So he's the one that should be able to, for example, say, hey, I'm accepting input from the outside. Perhaps I should, I don't know, write some very quick test and pass it to the test guys who are probably even less trained in, in uh, security than he is, just to start giving them a leg up on figuring out that addition to the, to the attack surface and see what they can do with it. But at least that gives them an, an, an alert to see that the attack surface changed, expanded. Uh, documentation changes. If he added some new, um, let's say, configuration of some new uh, run flag that changes posture and security or changes an object or something that might be interesting. He should be the one telling the guy that does the documentation, hey, this thing got added and this is the explanation and this is why I think that it should go into the security configuration guide or something. And the same thing with the deployment requirements. If, again, he opened a, a port, he's the one that perhaps should be telling the guy that does the, the deployment that, hey, your firewall m might need a, a, a change. So the thing here is that Bob is in the middle of all those things, and not only is he in the middle, he's the one that's generating those events. So the thing that I tried to do was give Bob a way to talk to all these people using a tool that he already knows, and in a way that not only these events get captured, but there's accountability, and that later on you can look at the events as they developed and use them as learning cases. So not only you get the thing done the right way, but later on, you can look back at what happened and measure it, count it, and learn from it. So the easiest way to do this, and I'm just going to use the generic name here, is to use something like Jira, Bugzilla, to have Bob fill these, these events and fire them in the right way. So you end up with, uh, again in double quotes, a, a bug queue for a threat model, for example. And the person or people who are responsible for that threat model are the ones who are responsible for taking those things out of the queue and making sure that they go all the way into the threat model and appear actually or are treated the right way. <coughs> now, um, when I first came to management with this, I actually got a, a bit of a a bit of a kick back, like they, they, they didn't really like it because they thought that this was going to eat on the developer time, which apparently is the one thing that we have around here that's sacred. You can do whatever you want, as long as you don't touch that thing called developer time. And um, then another one, another manager, told me, what you're talking about doesn't happen, because there is a spec. Everybody writes the spec, everybody follows the spec, everybody knows the spec. Uh, cue to me trying not to explode laughing in front of the guy. But uh, of course comes the question, if there is this so-called spec and everybody knows about it, then again, how come we keep missing those events? How come we keep not seeing those changes that happen and that are not reflected in, the, in all the 
artifacts that go around the, the, the development cycle. And as, a, as for the time of the developer, it is a bit funny for me because in that definition of time, security apparently is already baked in. So there seems to be already something happening in that slice of time called security. But again, the flaws keep coming out. The findings keep appearing. So what is it that's being done in that time that makes it so sacred that it can't be touched and that we can't do differently? And that's when he said the problem is that the developers are not educated enough to fire these events. They don't know that what, what they just did is actually a security event. And that got me, got me thinking, you know what, they, they, they have something there. Th there is something there. And that's when I got to thinking about learning versus training. There is a, a, a huge difference between the both of them. And Eric, in a previous keynote in uh, SecDev 2017, he pointed out that almost half of the developer population has a bachelor's degree with a major in a computer science related field. And some of them took security electives, but uh, from my observation in the universities, in the curriculum that are out there, most of that security is theory. We are talking about people learning access models for databases. We are talking about people learning uh, formal languages that can prove that a program is secure. These are not practical things. Th these guys, they can learn one day about concatenation, the next day about uh, access models to databases, but nobody's going to put both things together and show them, hey, you know, there's this thing called an SQL injection. There are some very, very good security programs out there at, at the university level. But the point is that the people that leave those, those programs, they're not going to be developers. They're going to be the people who push security forward. They're going to be the people who do research. But they are not running to our, uh, to our enterprises and saying, hey, I want to write the next, uh, I don't know, Excel. Okay? It's just not that, that kind of thing. So <coughs> if we look at the university, and, and that's the, the place where I actually disagree with Eric, if, if we look at the university as this high-level learning, uh, we can say, okay, so you can teach something practical at university. Yeah, you're going to teach one class, two classes in four years, and then you don't know when they're going. It could be in the first year, it could be in the last year. These guys come to the enterprise. The technology changed completely. And what do you do? So yeah, I agree. The university is a great place to teach security, but we have to look at that as a, a, a strategic le uh, level thing. What we need is to go down a bit. We need to go tactical. What is it that, that we can do at our level that will get people thinking this way? So we have this amazing thing called the training module, right? People come in and they take this training modules of two hours, something, and th there is usually there's a quiz, which somebody here tell me, what am I supposed to be learning from this quiz apart from basic logic and elimination? Right? But unfortunately, that's mostly the level of the things that we are asking people. If we start going down, then basically we are adding hours to the training curriculum, and that leads us to the same problem of the hours of the developer. They have other training that they have to take. They have to understand how things happen in that specific enterprise. And to be honest, that stuff may be a bit more important than spending 16 hours on security. Not only that, but they're going to spend th those 16 hours now. And then basically what we tell them is, go forth and be secure. You took the training. You know everything there is to know about security. From tomorrow on, I expect every single line of your code to be clean and your, your design to be safe. The thing is that this is not how people learn. This, this is not the right way to, to teach people. And worse, this is not the right way to expect people to actually give you results. If we get formal for a second, I stumbled on this hierarchy of uh, competence, Dr. Noel Birch. It's not new, it's quite uh, uh, traditional for the people that deal with this every day. And the whole point here is how people learn. And people learn by moving from this state 
of unconscious incompetence, trying to get into something called unconscious competence. Now, I'm not going to go s one by one because otherwise I'm going to, to be sounding like an ex-vice president and we really want to not do that. Everybody's annoyed by that. But basically what we want is to learn a skill. And the way to learn a skill is actually there's a, a good analogy. We talk all the time about dojos, we talk about being ninjas, about this and that. So allow me to use a real life example of how do you learn a skill. You start by learning step by step. It's instructional, there's theory. Somebody actually takes you through the steps of that skill, shows you how that thing works, how it's done. In the next step, you are just going to do that thing again and again and again and again and again. And what you're getting here, what you're doing here is you're building muscle memory. You are getting to a point where you know that thing so well that whenever the situation presents itself, you are able to use it without having to engage your conscience, without having to think about it. It just happens. It flows out of you. So we go from learning to training to applying. And that's the way people actually learn, ac acquire skills. Uh, you guys probably heard somebody saying it takes 10,000 times to, to become a master, uh, 10,000 hours to become a master into something. I heard that question, it's probably not 10,000 hours, it probably depends on what the something is. But the truth of the matter is that you can't expect to jump from learning to applying in one big step of two hours. But it is what we keep asking people to do. Right? So, what would happen if, in a perfect world, we had this library of training material, okay? We are talking about short videos, very, very short videos. We're talking five minutes of a video. We're talking about very focused reading material, not starting from 101 and ending in a PhD. Just that single thing that you need. You could search it by domain, by keywords, and it's easy to reach, it's easy to use, it's always there for you. In my opinion, that would be already a great leg up, okay? I hear from the content providers that they are already moving in that direction. There is something called just-in-time uh, learning. And I have seen some offerings. Personally, I don't think that they are where I would like them to be right now. Uh, some of them that I saw, for example, they take the two-hour module and they just jump to the place in the module where that gets explained. And while it's an interesting idea, those modules are built in a way that you, you get more of them if you actually see the whole thing than just jumping to, to short parts of it. <coughs> but let's assume for a second that this exists. So we have the how to do, which is the thing showing you how to do it, and we have the what to do. We have the, 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 security, the notable security events that I want the developer to be able to fire. Now, how do we get him to the point where he doesn't need this thousand times of repetition? He doesn't have to go over it again and again and again to get to that point where he can fire the, the event as soon as, as we can, okay? Well, we cheat. Not exactly this way, <laughs> okay? For you, <laughs> for you guys who remember it, that's not what I'm proposing, but in my opinion, it would be beautiful if we had something, don't know what, that we could divide by the domains that are interesting to us. For each domain had some triggers that start one of those notable events, for each one of those triggers would have a bunch of stuff that we want them to do. And that bunch of, of stuff actually has a clear definition, a clear implementation, clear ways of testing it, and could be multiplied by the languages that you are using to develop or something like that. So basically what I'm talking about is a checklist. Now, Adam Chostak there, in, uh, in his work on threat modeling, he offered a great critique on the use of uh, checklists in information security. And another, way, uh, another thing that he offered was a reference to the checklist manifesto that I 
actually uh, enjoyed very much. And I recommend also you guys too. It's short, it's short, yeah. And actually there is a, I only learned after the fact, on uh, Amazon you can, if you have uh, the unlimited thing, you can download the notes and they are pretty well done. But anyway, so <coughs> Adam's uh, critique was that a checklist, and I'm reading because of the details here, by definition is limiting. But it's extremely useful to prevent certain classes of problems. Perhaps not the ones that threat modeling needs, because threat modeling does have that measure and necessity of creativity. You have to be able to think outside the box to get to those things that are really interesting. But I posit that that's exactly the class of problems that we have at the implementation level. Those are the problems that we already know, those are the problems that keep repeating themselves, and those are the problems that we, worse than everything, can recognize. We are just failing to recognize them. Okay. Now, the checklist is not the, the be-all and do-all, but it's a tool to help the developer. Okay. It, it, it to, to help the developer recognize that thing where he is, that, that point where he is, where he has to do something. This is part of the checklist that I was working with. This is not the whole thing. The checklist, all the checklist takes two sides of an uh, A4 page. But uh, what's interesting is to, to see here is that A, this is not a top X, top 10, top 25 list. It's, it's informed by those, but it's not one of those. And it's not what's called the do confirm checklist. It's not you do something and then you go to the checklist and you confirm that you actually did it. It is what's called a read do checklist, saying that it, it takes the developer through a recognition of, of what they did and the actions that get triggered by what they did. Okay? The language of the checklist, and this is important, the trigger side, if you did this, has to be written in a way that the developer recognizes as what they did in their code, not in a security language, not in some arcane thing that uses vocabulary and jargon that they have to be educated on. It has to be written on something that they can read and say, wait, yeah, I did this. I, 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 I did use some cryptography. Now let's see what I do because I used cryptography. The second side, the, the then do that, the action, that's the thing that's going to lead us to the just-in-time training or to the reference or to the FAQ or to the wiki or to the whatever. But it's written very clearly what is it that you want the guy to, to do. Leaving absolutely almost no question about what's expected from the developer. So when creating the checklist, these were some things that I had in, in, in mind as like the absolute values that I needed to have it there. I have one checklist per domain. So the one that I'm using right now is a generic one. It doesn't have any particular domain. But uh, I'm working on a, a couple of others that are more specific. Each one of the items in the list has to follow the if you did this trigger, then do that action. Each one of the actions has to be concise, testable, and supported either by JIT training or by some other form of uh, instruction. And again, the trigger must be written in a language that the developer ha can recognize as their own. If this means including uh, wording that's specific to that product team, because they have their own thing, they have their own libraries or whatever, or their own jargon, then so be it. But the important thing is that they are able to look at that and not question if it's something that they did or not. They have to be able to, to recognize it. Above the, the checklist, there is a, uh, a bunch of catch-all security events. Those are the other notable events. So every time that you did something and it got triggered by one of the conditions in the checklist, then consider these three things. Consider creating a security test, consider letting somebody know about the, the threat model changes, and consider changing the documentation as needed. So instead of repeating that on each one of the different uh, uh, items, it just, uh <coughs> sorry, it just um, happens. So of course I had to pilot this, I had to make a, a, an experiment. I went to one of my large product teams at the time, and I went to the management and introduced the checklist. That's when I got the feedback of the, the spec that I spoke about before. 
uh, I ended up getting two smaller teams that were part of that big production uh, product team. And one was a GUI, the other was a, a, the back end. There was no JIT training. And what that meant was that the security team had to stand up and provide that guidance, just because we didn't have anything to point people to. It was a short-term experience because basically shortly after I changed uh, positions. Now, this was the subjective feedback that I really got happy to, to, to have. The developers came and said, for the first time in this whole security uh, thing, I know what you want from me. You're not talking to me in, in big terms that I look at you and I have no clue what you're talking about. I know what is it that you want me to do. The testers looked at the checklist and said, this is useful for us as well. We can take this and we can look even on a reverse way and say, well, these are the things that we have to be testing for if somebody eventually does something like the triggers, or they can use it in the trigger action uh, way in their, sorry, in their own way. And the team greatly appreci appreciated the, the use of Gyra to pass information around. It was a mechanism that they were very well acquainted with. It was very natural for them to use it, and it adapted well to the to the setting. The one problem was that until the developers came to realize what is actually a good event, there was some overload. There were many, many tickets that were produced. But the good thing is, is that first, they weren't lost. We weren't del deleting tickets. And when they got closed because they are not relevant, there was always a reason why they're not relevant. So basically, we could collect all that and create documentation to better explain to the, to the developers what is it that we're interested in. We could create an FAQ and say, hey, if it's something like this, then you perhaps you don't need to. Again, management had some reservations. That was the added load on developers was first the time and then the time to create the tickets. But again, you come to them and say, seriously, you, you're telling me that the developer can't do this because he has to create tickets. That, that's basically what they do. <coughs> then I had two questions. Uh, actually, an affirmation and, and a question. We already do it in code reviews, and why not do it at code reviews? And to tell you the truth, I don't have a problem with you doing it in coding reviews, but you are not going to get the right effects. The code reviews are usually done, at that in that setting at least, it was done by uh, senior programmers, people who basically already had a lot of experience, and some of them did have security knowledge. What I'm doing this whole thing for is to get that muscle memory in the hands of the developer, of the developer in the line, the developer writing, the, the guy that was an intern yesterday. Okay, so if you do it at code reviews, you're basically not doing any knowledge transfer at all. You're not imp imprinting that thing into the mus muscle memory. You are keeping it at a higher level. And how often will this be refreshed? That was an interesting one, because at that time I had absolutely no answer. To me, it looked like the technologies in that specific group, the things that they were using, would be set in stone for such a length of time that I wouldn't have to worry about refreshing this. But I can see different places where things change a bit faster that might necessitate some uh, refresh from here and there. So just to bring everything around, uh, what are the expectations and what people get out of this? The developer? He takes the responsibility of checking that security checklist before they commit code. And by this checking, what I mean is, remember that I said mine right now is less than one page of paper. Bring that thing, put it on plastic, have by the side of your desktop. As soon as you are thinking about commi uh, committing your code, take a moment, go line by line, go item by item, see if you did something like that. See if something like that seems recognizable from what you wrote in code and then do the triggers before you commit, before you send it to the big static code analyzer in the sky. Um, the developer can trigger the, the threat model change if, if needed, can create a security test case if needed, and can inform the security documentation again if needed. The tester, they can use the checklist f and the training library for education. So they can use that as something that's going to guide the way that they do their tests. And they consume whatever tests the security 
that the develop, uh, developer uh, decides to do as a starting point for what they do. So if something came in that they don't have a test for yet, they're able to use that. And perhaps most important, management understands that that use of that different use of the time of the developer does give you a higher return. And even more important, management has to enforce the use of the checklist as part of a coding standard or a definition of done. If we leave it to them, they'll probably use it once, twice, but might fall into the cracks. But if there is enforcement coming from management, it gets done. The effects that were observed, uh, people started actually using the training material. They started going back to the training material instead of us saying, hey, it's about that time that you take the training again. We minimized those nice moments when basically one person would say, well, this is how we do it, and the de developer would raise his hand and say, that's not exactly how I did it. Because all of a sudden everybody was looking at a much clearer um, image of what the system actually was. There was a lot of accountability. All of a sudden things became so transparent that people were feeling responsible not only to, to themselves, but to the team and to the, uh, to the artifacts that they were creating. Because of the use of Jira, we were, we were able to mine the tickets that were created and get to some form of knowledge base for security. There was much, much, much data that was generated that uh, can be mined and can be counted and can be timed and we can actually measure how these things happen and extract something usable from there. Uh, it scales. Once they stop depending so much on the security team, we saw that they would come when something really interesting or that the list didn't cover and it looked like it should cover appeared. And at the end of the day, what I really, really wanted to happen was shortening the loop. That happened. There was less bad stuff going in down the pipe that would come back as an interruption and um, take more time away from the, the developer and raise the chances that they would be burned out. And that started happening. So now uh, a small invitation to collaborate. I'm putting up the what I have on a small GitHub uh, repository. It's very alpha. If what I put forward here is something that you guys feel like you would like to work on, let me know. I'll give you access. We can start uh, uh, collaborating on that. And if you are an e-learning provider, if you work closely with one and you would like to tell them, hey, it's time for just-in-time training, what, is it, wha what are your plans for that? Or if you want to turn to safe code or even to OWASP and see if uh, a volunteer uh, project can take form creating that, uh, that kind of training, then that's something that I would love to be involved in. Questions? No? Thank you guys very much. Oh, I forgot the mark. <laughs> With the just-in-time training, do you have any example of the, let's say, uh, any like uh, static code analysis thing that you can do in the IDE or anything like that? Is that what you had in mind, or mm. like, uh, is that a thing that can be tied to just-in-time training? You think? So, from what I've seen, there is that effort to put things in the IDE, and as you write code, already check it and already suggest it. That to me is a bit of the clip it approach, and I don't think that many people would like that. On the other hand, there is the effort to do the, the analysis on smaller chunks of code and get smaller reports. That I think is a bit more uh, effective. That's, that's definitely better. But my problem with tools is that they really go against creating that muscle memory. And sometimes they give you a false sense of sa uh, sa uh, safety that says, well, I run it and I didn't get anything, so I'm golden. While we know that those tools are good, but they are, they are not that good. So that's why I prefer to have the checklist and have the developer actually understand what is it that they're doing, instead of just trusting in some big tool in the sky. So the tool is there to help 
the developer, not the developer offloads all responsibility to the tool. You see, when you say something like that, it's almost like Java don't have security problems, which I don't think is right. It might have different ones, but it's not like it doesn't have them. So, yeah. All right. Thank you guys very much. It was an honor.